Hi. Hello. Uh, we're very thankful to... Is it too loud? We're very thankful to all who came despite last night's business development efforts. And um, uh, it's really surprising to see so many faces at 9 in the morning. Uh, so we, we actually expected maybe five people. So we wrote the presentation for the future for people who will download it from the vault and read it. Uh, it's a little bit more explicit than it could have been. So uh, maybe you want to check it out later when it's on the vault. Uh, I'll just quickly jump into this and run through the background. I'm in the games business for 15 years, been publishing most in Russia, Eastern Europe, typically releasing a few games every month, different games, um, stuff like The Lion King and whatever THQ is putting out, but also working with a lot of indie teams like Frictional and Italic and Amanita, and so from small to large. And um, since last year, I'm working with Larian and with Sven helping the studio to self-publish. And currently we're looking at Divinity Series, at Dragon Commander, and Divinity Original Scene, which is coming out throughout the next 12 months. In terms of projects that I've gone through, I had stuff like Mass Effect and Second Feature from CDP, um, hardcore stuff like Hearts of Iron, Indie stuff like Machinarium, Divinity 2 by this man here on the stage. Um, also branded stuff like Wally by Pixar. So each of that projects had a different angle. You couldn't do certain stuff on Wally that you could on Divinity, and you could have a lot of support from CDP, but very strict support from Bioware, especially after the transaction with EA. Um, and on SpongeBob, I still remember that he had to have the same number of spots on his face whenever you pictured him. And that was like the checklist for us. Um, in terms of results, when we took care of Divinity 2 in the Russian territories, we outsold Dragon Age. Uh, despite bigger marketing campaign from Dragon Age and despite a lot of big stuff, uh, which proves to me that you can still outsell the big guys if you do the things rightly, uh, same can be said about The Witcher 2 and Skyrim. In the launch period, The Witcher 2 had a bigger, warmer reception due to a number of small factors. And this proves to me that it doesn't matter what is the name of your company. It matters how you do it. And a small studio can be more successful than a big company. It doesn't really matter what the headcount is. It matters how you do it. Uh, my good friend at Disney used to say that the more projects you do, the more experienced you become. But he says it with different words. <laughs> and now for Sven. Uh, hi, I'm Sven, and thank you also for coming uh, this morning. It was very early. Uh, so I've been making games since 97. Uh, uh, I'm best known, or my company is best known for the Divinity series. And I started this industry uh, thinking of publishers as gods. And gradually I came to different insights. Uh, I also was very naive when I entered this industry. I thought that first and foremost they were a source of financing and then somehow boxes got into the shops and I never really thought about the entire process in between. And gradually I picked up bits and, uh, and other bits here and there. And so eventually I started saying, well, you know what, all these guys, they are uh, doing interesting things. So, um, yeah, so Divinity Games, they sold well. Uh, we make our living with it. We never got really rich as a studio with it because typically our publishers were taking most of the money out of that. So that's why we started self-publishing, one of the reasons at least. And uh, we got some awards and uh, things with the Divinity series. So our team is about 50 developers right now. And since last year, one year exactly actually, because we started uh, our self-publishing activities at Gamescom, uh, we started adding a publishing team. And so we're, today we're going to tell you about how that's going and what our tri uh, tribulations have been so far. Okay. So yeah, this is the softography. We can quickly go through it, given that Sergei's managed to put in 80 slides or something. I was so. trying to keep people interested. <laughs> if we finish in the middle, it's fine. Okay. So uh, this is uh, the more of the interesting things. So we are releasing a couple of games uh, next year, uh, Divinity Original Sin and Dragon Commander. And as we're gearing up for doing that, we're st starting to do some uh, tryouts in publishing. So we started re-releasing some of our older games. And uh, today we're going to talk quite a lot about 
or experiences uh, with that. And uh, as it says here, we're responsible now. There's nobody to blame. In the past, we often blamed marketing at one publisher or said, well, well typically it was always the publisher's fault, be it the development manager, be it the marketing director, be it some guy in QA who wasn't giving us any good QA reports, but there was always somebody to blame, and now there's nobody left to blame but ourselves. I am to blame. I am the evil guy <laughs> inside the studio. That is actually true. Uh, we want to run quickly through the whole presentation right now. There's going to be six slides, and that's the whole presentation, and then we're going to talk more about this. So we thought maybe some people want to go and have coffee, and then they can do it after six slides. Uh, <coughs> we would like to define publishing as the combination of three things. The first is the money. This is how you make money through business development. Your deals, your contracts, your agreements, your payment terms, your partnerships. How do you get the money into the studio for the stuff that you deliver? And you start with unhappy people, you end up with happy people, maybe different people. <laughs> uh, and we believe that the only way for this to happen, for business development to be successful, is to look both at the terms and at the people so you can be partners. Otherwise, you're not going to survive the first trouble. The second part of publishing, as we define it, is communication. It used to be PR, but now it's not really PR. It's now more of talking to media and talking to the community. And talking to the community probably is now more important than talking to media. It hasn't been so five years ago. The difference is that 10 years ago, you need to go to the magazine. The magazine will publish the article. The article will be read by the users. Uh, now the users have whatever they want and their iPads and, and, and iPhones and they read the news and you can stop thinking, how do I get the message? But you should start thinking about what's the message from my studio. The final part of publishing, probably the most boring, but the most difficult is releasing, it used to be marketing. It's all that stuff. It's what the price is, how does the screenshot look like, what is the cover art, what is the name of the game, and everything should be at the same day on all the platforms when you go out. Uh, if you look at each small thing, it's not really important. Will your game tank if you call it differently? Probably not. But when you put all of them together and then you launch, the first day or the first week will define your success or failure, and very often these little things, they can uh, cause you a lot of trouble or make your sales very long in coming up. Okay. So uh, the fourth point is that it's something that requires a lot of focus. Uh, when we started this uh, publishing affair, I thought we were going to be able to do it on the site, and I didn't realize that it was going to overtake my entire team, actually. So part-time publishing is a, is a very, very, very bad idea, and we actually started doing it that way, and then we learned uh, the hard way that it's also a bad idea. So this is the publisher and the developer, but yeah. it doesn't matter as long as they are separate. <laughs> and, yeah. Okay, uh, so, and it basically links to the previous point. If you're trying to do it on a, a part-time activity, then you're also to going to try to do shortcuts. So uh, initially when we started doing this entire self-publishing thing, uh, with every single thing that Sergey came, we actually asked him, is this really necessary? We don't see why we should be spending a week of our valuable development time on doing this particular thing, which looks, to be honest, crazy and stupid. And uh, again, we, 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 st we started turning our, our, our tails there when we started figuring out this stuff is actually working, and we'll give some examples later on. And then the last part is that, uh, yeah, sales. <laughs> uh, the quality of your game matters. If it's a bad game, it's probably not going to sell, although sometimes you might have some very good publisher and it will work. Uh, but publishing is going to amplify that quality in terms of sales. So you might make the best game in the world, you may sell a million of it, and if you have good publishing behind it, you're going to sell two million about it. And this is going to allow you to make better games in the future. So the amplification uh, of publishing is not to be underestimated. And we've had some success stories already in our very early uh, tryouts as uh, self-publishing developers. So to summarize this, Summary. Publishing is business development, communication, and releasing taken together. In terms of business development, you want to do partnerships, you want to look at the people and the terms. In terms of communication, you want to write good stuff and then let the media or users find it and take care of it. And in terms of releasing, 
It's the same thing as going to the publisher. If you were going to Ubisoft to sell your title, but you're going in front of all the audience and everybody's going to say in comments and give you feedback. So it's the most important day for you when you launch that product. And this is the summary of your three slides. Really? Well, <laughs> uh, so no, the, the most important thing, I mean, through all of this is take it seriously. Don't take it as something that's just going to be easy to do. I mean, I, I, I look at myself because I, I'm the founder and the CEO of my company, and I know that I've actually hindered the self-publishing other company because I, I couldn't imagine that I had to take it so seriously that it was so much work. And uh, that's probably the, the biggest takeaway of the entire lecture today. So yeah, let's go on. Sure. Uh, that's it. Goodbye, guys. Yeah, that's it. So we can all go and have breakfast. Um, now we're going to do the proper thing. So let's talk about what makes the publishing and what makes these three areas that uh, will make your studio able to self-publish. This is how most people see business development. And it used to be like this 10 years ago. You would go to a party, you will drink um, some booze with your publishing friends, and you'll arrange some deal and maybe screw a developer or two. And make a ton of money this way, uh, but the times are gone because everything is direct to consumer. And, and it's really now a lot of work and a lot of effort and a lot of Excel sheets and calculations and forecasting and calls and meetings. In the essence, business development is about money and it's about figures. So the first thing that you'll be able to do is you'll be able to create your Excel sheet and say, if I sell this many units, I'll make this much money. If I sell this many units in Germany, I'll make this much money, and so on and so on. So from the first look, it should be easy to solve mathematically. Uh, you could define it as the road between saying, we want to come out in October in five countries, and actually having the deals for those five countries with specific terms, payments, rights, whatever. Uh, so probably the majority of teams will start by saying, this guy is good at math. Let him do the Excel sheet. It works, but half the time. The problem is that everybody's going to bullshit you. Uh, you're going to travel to, I don't know, Bolivia, and they're going to tell you that they're selling millions of copies and that they're going to pay you 5 million, whatever the currency is in Bolivia, and, and you're going to get this the moment you deliver the master. So there's a lot of false information floating around. Everybody likes to boast. We like to boast. You like to boast. The publishers like to boast. The distributors like to boast. So when we had the first round of meeting, we came back and we said, it's not possible that he's number one, he's number one, he's number one, and he's number one. There's only one number one. <laughs> but everybody was number one in their country. Uh, the second thing is that when we had the meetings, we felt initially that we like some people more, and we can go with them. And we didn't like certain people, but they were offering tons of cash. And we ended up working with people that we like, not because we are like, you know, people versus money, people, no, but because with the people we like, we were able to establish a dialogue. We were able to call them up in the middle of Saturday and say, hey, here's an idea. How about this and this? You have to look at the people as much as you look at the money because the people will pay you money. So it's important to have someone who likes you and who respects you to work together. Uh, literally, I think today is the fourth month that I'm sitting on the German deal, which is done and signed and so on, but we're still tweaking the details. The French deal took us, I think, maybe five months. Uh, the Russian deal keeps evolving. The Polish deal is evolving still. We're changing certain things. It's unbelievable how simple it looks when it's done, but how long it will take for you, for example, to go to a new country and sign up a contract and work with them. It's okay. It's normal. If it takes you months, it's normal for everyone like this. Nobody has it like that. So you shouldn't get stressed. And also, the markets are different. I learned something about the Australian market last week. I didn't know anything about this. And I've been doing this for a while. So any team should be ready to say, it's a new field for us. We're going to learn stuff, and it's going to take us time. It's okay. Uh, the Excel and the partners will get you there. That's my message for the biz dev. And now some experience based on Laria. <laughs> uh, so I used to do biz dev for my company myself. We always did some smaller deals, licensing deals. Occasionally we did a finished good deal. So we were dabbling in publishing. But um, this guy comes in and says, OK, so who are we going to use for Germany, for instance? How, who is going to sell the game in Germany? 
And so I said, oh, we used to work with these guys, and in the past we worked with these guys. That wasn't that good. That wasn't that good either. So maybe we can get something better. But maybe those guys, they were great. So, and then he goes to work. And before I know it, I'm seeing people I had never heard of. I'm seeing files. I'm seeing numbers pass by. And at the end of the day, like after a couple of months, I've said, you know what? We haven't made any single progress. But what we did have was an entire overview of what everybody was willing to offer, what their end-to-end -end chain was, how they were going to put your product in market, what their costs were. And indeed, they were all the best in their own markets. So we had to do their background checks. And it was, it was amazing, the amount of numbers. Um, the takeaway from that was that uh, that work, it, and it was really a lot of work and a lot of flying and traveling, uh, it probably increased our margin by 50%. And that 50% is going to help us in the future to make even better games because we're going to earn more money out of it. So it's worthwhile taking it very seriously. So don't accept the first deal. That's probably my biggest message in there. Then the second thing is also all these questions here, and on the next slide also, they all apply to the same thing. Learn the market before you sign anything. Don't trust the party on the other side of the table to tell you all the facts about the market. Go there, look at it, and sometimes that's easy to do, of course, if it's in Germany and you're living in Belgium, and sometimes it's hard to do if you're in, uh, living in uh, Belgium and you have to go to Australia, although I don't think you'll mind going to Sydney. I <laughs> wouldn't mind, no problem. Uh. So uh, ask a lot of questions. That's definitely something I learned out of that. And then, yeah, talk to people, I guess. There is a lot of information coming in from different partners, and... and I cannot make decisions because I'm not in the development. I cannot say we can release in October or a partner calls me up and says, we'd like the game to come out in January. I don't know. I don't know what's happening with the development. I go to this guy and I say, here's what they think. If you go out here, it's this much. If they go here, it's this much. And here's the different context. And then together we make a decision. I don't think a publisher can make a decision without a developer sitting next to him, but the same thing goes for developer next to publisher. For all of you, for the studios, it means that you have to have someone in your team who's just like sitting in this little house and thinking, I'm a publisher, I'm a publisher, I'm, a pub I'm thinking about what's good for the studio in terms of money, in terms of business. And then you go to this guy and you talk to him and you say, so in terms of like this little business house, what do you think we should do? And then you get the feedback together. Um, now about the PR and the communication, which is the second big thing. Uh, I was browsing some of the indie studios websites and pages and I had this big discovery that all the cool people that I knew, most of them had pretty dead pages and pretty dead blogs. And all the blogs were talking about was that there was a sale and there was a review. But I already know about them. I own the game. I'm not going to go there and get excited about the fact that they have a sale going on. I wanted to know who they are, what they do, what, what is the thought behind the current game. And very few studios actually give you that. The thing is, as a developer, you have a story. It's very hard for a publisher, for a big publisher, for, let's say, oh, let's give names, okay, THQ, to come out and get you excited about something. Oh, we're THQ, we're in business forever, and we've got millions of cash, and, and, and here's our story. On the other hand, if you're a developer, you can say, I've done this and this, and this is what's different, and this is my vision, and this is my future. I can have a meaningful conversation with any developer for hours. It's very hard to talk to a publisher this way because they're all corporate. They cannot say this and this. They can't add their public companies. They cannot say what's going to happen in the future and so on. Uh, media, the new kind of media, the media that will influence your sales, they like you. They like developers. They like people who create stuff because you've got here the inspiration, the creativity. This is what's so good about this industry. We all want to actually go and get to know people who make fun stuff. And... As a developer, you should make an effort to let us know what's happening inside of your head. Uh, I don't know if any of you were in the times of Virgin Interactive when they were sending out press kits with a piece of meat and, and, and a CD, and you had to go into this blood and flesh and extract the CD, which made the coverage. Somebody sued them in London because they had a heart attack or something. But those times are over, I think. The time of the game as the big contradictory show is over. It's now about the development and the vision and the guy in glasses and maybe a beard sitting in a small room <laughs> and talking about his vision. I'm not talking about me. I'm, I'm like, I'm just, you know, camouflaging. Yeah. Um, the best designers that are making products, iPhones, games, they understand the users, the people who do this. The best communication people that you will have, you will need for your team, they understand the readers. When I go to a Facebook page, what do I want to see? I want to see the identity, the uniqueness of your team. I don't want to read the fact that 
you know, you get 80% scores somewhere. It's nice, but it's not essential to me and to my understanding. And as a community, I want interaction. I want to be able to go and say, I loved your game, but I thought you should make it harder. And to hear back from you so that you can say, well, we tried, but it didn't work, you know, because most people gave up. And I was like, cool, I'm talking to this guy whose game I love. That's, that's the connection. Um, the other thing that that is obvious is that there's a lot of media coverage. If you go to video games 24-7, there's this whole wall of news coming up and down. You're going to be one of them. So it doesn't make sense to release something tiny or small or boring. You have to actually put an effort in generating content and putting it out. And for us, it was a big lesson. We thought we were so cool we can do it in five minutes every morning. Yeah. <laughs> it took us hours. Mm -hmm. And we had to make a choice between development work and actually putting some stuff for communication. Yeah, so we always were very happy when somebody wrote something nice about our games, and so we posted our previews and the quotes and the reviews, and we wanted everybody to know about it. And we always thought we didn't have sufficient channels to tell everybody about. Look at how cool this particular guy writing for Magazine X thinks our games is. And at the same time, we were doing something which um, we didn't realize was so powerful. We had a forum which has about 15,000 uh, players on there, and we were talking to them. We were talking about the design, but it was very close. And I mean, if you go to the Larian site still today, because we haven't redesigned it yet, trying to find our forum, I mean, you're pretty good at navigation, and you should uh, get a degree for that. Uh, but um, we were going direct with our consumers for all those years, and we didn't amplify this. And so this man came in, and he was saying, what the hell are you doing on that forum? And I said, well, we're talking to the players because we're trying to figure out some things, if they like it or they don't like it. These are the people that play our games, and it's the only way that we can communicate with them. And he says, and what does your Facebook page look like? Well, it's got previews, it's got reviews. <laughs> so people can see uh, how cool our games are and what people think are. And so he started to turning everything around, and the first thing he said was like to me, you have to start writing a blog. And you have to write a blog, and you just have to stay the, thing, the, the things that uh, come up in your mind. And he made a little plan. He said, here are, here are cool topics that I've seen in the forum posts, or I heard you talk about. Just put it on the blog, and people will see what happens. So I started doing that, and I was very candid in it. And what I didn't realize is that in the background, he was amplifying it. He was saying uh, to the journalists, have a look at this blog. And before I knew it, I was on gamesindustry.biz admitting that that I was uh, an old pirate, that I ha hacked games and cracked them. And he was just making it into stories. And this blog, I saw this peak going enormously in the air of the amount of people that were coming to it. And then it suddenly started translating into coverage. And that was one of the first lessons I got into this publishing thing is actually working. He's just taking a little piece of content which he thinks might be interesting to the readers or the, to, to the audience. He amplifies that, and that works, and he makes it accessible. And, but then we, the, the, the blog got syndicated. We got onto a couple of major websites, and uh, the first couple of them was really good and really high ratings, and then the ratings went down of the blog. And uh, I started getting, uh, being uh, assaulted, basically, because I was writing about things which did not fit the target audience of this particular magazine. Whereas I was still thinking of my initial idea, well, this is what I was doing on my forum. So suddenly I found myself standing like this and like this and like this. I'm writing for these guys and I'm writing for these guys and I'm writing for these guys. And it suddenly became like something I was spending a day a week on. So and I'm heading my company also. So again, here was a very simple idea. It can be amplified. It was successful. But then suddenly there was no time to support it. And so it gradually then went away. It's still being supported, of course, but not as much as we wanted to support it. And the same goes for a lot of activities that we started doing initially. So we had... Um, or I, think, I don't know how many Facebooks and Twitters that we started setting up when we <laughs> began this exercise and, and, and forum activities and then posts and uh, you don't want to know all the stuff that we were doing, but there was no time. We thought we could do it in the morning, we could do it in the evening, and now we're interviewing plenty of people to uh, come and help us. We need community managers, we need PR managers, and as the business development started bringing in more work because they said, okay, we have a deal in Germany, so we're not going to talk to the German audience, we're going to talk to the French audience, we're going to talk to the Polish audience, we're going to talk to the American audience. All these audiences, they're different, and they actually like it if you talk to them in their own language, and it's like, whoa! Yeah, so I went to my budget and I looked like, okay, well, instead of one publishing guy, maybe we need two publishing guys. Well, but well, actually, <laughs> I ran into, I, I was a bad developer in the publishing shoes. I ran into this overstretching thing without realizing that publishing is like development. So I came to him and I said, the Germans want to read in German. So we're setting up the German Twitter and the French Twitter and the Russian Twitter and the Polish Twitter. 
And we've done this first push that probably you're familiar with when you're a developer, like you, you work seven days a week for a couple of weeks and things start to happen and he goes on Facebook and we do Q&A and people respond and we've got like 50 comments and 60 comments. But you cannot sustain this unless you have a system. So after a couple of months, it sort of died. And now we suck at communication. We, we still have a lot to do. We're, we've got a pretty bad Facebook page. We've got, like, we know how good it could be if we stop working and focus on doing this. And now we're back to work and we're looking for a communication sort of setup to take care of it as well as we've done. My advice would be to be realistic about what you can achieve. If you can do just one post every month, do it. This post will get great coverage, people will come, people will like you, people will talk to you. They loved it when Sven went and answered. Like players could ask from Poland or from Russia, they could ask, why can't I play for a female knight in, in, in Dragon Commander? And he was the guy who was answering it with a vision straight from his head. That was beautiful, but now it takes a lot of time, so we have to sort of adjust it. Yeah, so one of the things I think we did do right is how we've been handling our PR so far. I mean, well, I know, uh, but we, we had a good approach in there. So uh, part of our strategy is that we want to be as local as we can in each, uh, in each market. So we want to be as German as we can be in Germany. We want to be as American as we can when we're talking to the US. And uh, we realized that we couldn't do that, so we hired specialists in each territory. So for instance, in the US, we hired a PR agency of a guy who's a pretty good PR agent, and he's helped with the amplification of our message. In Germany, we looked very long and hard at how to do it here, so we ended up hiring a publisher. So this is a very new thing, actually. In the past, it would be a publisher hiring a developer. Here, we are hiring the services of a publisher to help us. We're doing the same thing in France. We in, in other countries, we're taking another approach. Uh, but we are putting a strong focus on making sure that we have somebody in each territory that talks to the press directly, who knows the press also, because press from territory to territory is very different. So if you want to have presence in media, you need to have something like this. You are not going to have offices everywhere, so the next best thing is to have at least people everywhere. And the, the way you do that is by hiring freelancers or making partnerships with local publishers, which you then pay for their services. And they're actually open to that also, which was, for, to me, a very big surprise. I think we managed quite successfully to start from the idea that if you go to the publisher, the publisher just wants your money and, and, and they sort of want to sit on their product and, and then tell you how to do stuff to the relationship where we work together. And we're telling them what to do, but we're also taking their opinion and then we're making choices in each of the market, meaningful choices. And for markets like Germany and France and Poland and Russia, I don't think that we can sort of understand the market quickly and go in and do stuff. So we have to team up with certain, certain entities, whether or not it's a PR agency in America or it's a publisher in France or in Germany. And they're very helpful. They actually are open to this relationship. It just takes a few steps to set up that relationship that's beneficial to both. And, yeah. you know, the cost of this is what? less than $10,000 a month. It's not that expensive. And it's also, I mean, it's fairly new to a lot of people also, especially those publishers you work with locally, but they're indeed very open to it. It's, um, it works. And we need to move on. And I think, I think, I think it's the cost of this is less than having two guys in house or one guy in house for each mm. territory, definitely. Uh, the third part, releasing, formerly known as marketing. Um, when you launch the product, let's say we launched the game about five weeks ago, we had the people coming in, making decisions whether or not to buy and leaving. You have this big spike. Then you have another big spike when the people bought the game, talked about this, the reviews come up, and maybe they will come and, and do this. Your biggest chance is with your new game. Everybody says, oh, your new game just came out. Come and look for this. When you go to Rock, Paper, Shotgun, and you post some screens, you'll see those comments. Take my money, take my money. I'm throwing money at the screen. It's not scratching. Very nice. We all like to think that this means that we're going to have financial success. But the moment you actually want people's money, people's behavior changes. I don't know if you're familiar with GOG, but if you go to GOG, you can see a lot of people complaining about the difference of $1. It's nothing to us, to you, to me, whatever. In the PNL, it doesn't show. But there are still people who will love your game but complain about $1. So every choice that you make, the screenshots you put, the trailer, the price you set up, the description, the features. The thing that many developers are bad at, and many publishers also, is describing games compactly. Try to describe your game in one sentence. Try to explain to me who is doing what, where, why, and how. 
a lot of times you read the description and you get the idea, okay, it's a fantasy something. What I, I don't know what. We rewrote and rewrote and rewrote our text and we sort of killed ourselves trying to come up with a short description of what Divinity games are all about. How would you post this on Twitter when you buy a game? You say, oh, yeah, I bought this game. It's about blah, blah, blah. That's it. You don't really have this kilobyte of text to say it's the award-winning, uh, whatever, acclaimed, critically, genre-defining, original stuff. You, you don't. You just say it's a game about the guy who jumps and then you can go back in time, but it's cool. Okay. You may, I don't know, maybe you think this is bullshit. But I had many discussions about the things like when you have a box and you have three screens, you can have A, B, C, or you can switch them over, or you can make them like this. To me, it changes the perception of people. There are some people who came to Divinity page and they saw like, oh, action, action, oh, it's an action game, Pff, screw it. We changed. You go and you see action, dialogue, inventory, and then action, action, action. So you actually see, oh, okay, it's got stuff. It's got conversations. It's interesting. This will affect your bottom line. Whatever you put on your page, the sequence, the text, the writing, it will translate into money for you long term and short term. Uh, the thing that changed recently is that with people coming on forums and talking, any problem becomes explosive within hours. Uh, I know some people who had nine hours of technical problems at the launch of their game last month. From a darling of the industry, they went into the most hated industry and then they came back next day. But in those nine hours, the forums were a pretty dangerous <laughs> place to show up. It's broadcasting life. And whenever you launch something, we launched, you know, we have producers at Larian who have tens of years of experience. And still we were sitting like this and fixing stuff and changing this and sending emails to Steam and to GOG and to everyone. The final point about releasing is that American sales will make half of your money, typically, if you're good. You have big markets that don't speak English. And if you release the game and then you think, eh, I'll lock a lot into French when it becomes popular in France, it's probably not going to become popular in France. People from France or people from Russia, or let's say people from Poland, they come, they see that you haven't translated the text, you haven't offered them the Polish version. And they say, OK, screw it. I'm going to go and torrent it. Why should I pay you money if you don't think about my customer base? The best example I've seen in the industry was a Sony and Capcom's discussion about whether or not they should localize console titles into Russian. One guy said, we will localize when there is a market. And the other guy said, we will localize for the market to happen. And I think this is the approach, is if you want to have sales in, I don't know, in Poland, I'm using Poland a lot this presentation. If you want to have sales in Poland, you should localize in Poland. Don't wait for them to come and beg for your phone. Yeah. So um, we started, we have this little publishing entity active at Laren, and we think we'll talk about later what it looks like. And uh, we released a game which was uh, released originally in 2002, which is called Divine Divinity. And um, we position it differently because we don't have a lot of money, so we don't have the money to make huge, fantastic cinematic trailers. And so instead what we have, we have a video guy and he just films all the time. And we try to come up with cool, creative stuff and present it like that. So our, our way of presenting Divine Divinity on Steam was a, um, a confessions trailer where we simulated people who were addicts uh, to Divinity and they didn't have a life. And so they finally got out of it and now somebody's re-releasing it and it destroys their life. Uh, so the trailer was cool, and we also made Steam exclusive, which was also something which was new. Steam wasn't used to that, so we, we actually want to do something more with uh, that, but we weren't allowed to. No, never mind. Uh, and um, that worked pretty well. People said, oh, it's a pretty cool trailer, but you didn't see anything from the gameplay when you were looking at that trailer. Uh, so what Sergey was talking about, that you need to be extremely reactive and extremely nimble. That is your key advantage as a developer who is self-publishing. You don't have to go through a big uh, red tape or, or green light process in order to do something to move you can do it right away. You just say, okay, let's do it. So he says, well, people are complaining somewhere on that block that the trailer doesn't show gameplay footage. And in less than 24 hours, a gameplay trailer was added to Steam. So that's a very, very, uh, th that nimbility and that flexibility is very important. And I think the difference was that we had this discussion about the trailer and there was one guy on the team who said, well, they're just stupid. They should go to YouTube and type in Divinity and they will see thousands of those videos showing gameplay. But the majority of the team was saying, we don't care. They want a gameplay trailer. We give them a gameplay trailer. And I think this is the approach that if you use it as a studio, you'll be very successful with your community because you, you shouldn't question others stupid. Cannot they use Google? You should just, you know, adapt to their behavior. 
Yeah, so here's another example. And so the, uh, this is typically a bug. And I mean, um, I have been in situations where my publisher said, uh, this publisher does not release patches because our products don't, don't contain bugs. I actually have that as a quote of my wall, so I will never forget it. Uh, and we always wanted to patch very rapidly, and some people have these big processes that it takes three weeks before you can release a patch. I'm more of the op opinion, you see something going wrong, like fix it as fast as you can so that you don't get the, ch the shit storm that Sergey is talking about. And, and I, I don't know how it is for you guys, but for us it is, uh, for me it used to be like that. When I think about my game, I think about it uh, about the English version. I don't really think about the Polish or the Russian version. And I didn't think about it that way because in the past it was my publisher handling that. My publisher got my localization kit, he integrated it, and then he did some deal which I've never seen. I never met those people, and he was going to release it in Russia. So what did I care if the Russian installer wouldn't work? But now I'm very much involved. I'm dealing with those partners. I see them eye to eye. And the, like hell, I'm going to allow that there's going to be a problem in their version. But that means that your work also amplifies. You can't just postpone, well, it's the Tibetan version. We don't care about the Tibet version. No, you have to deal with the Tibet version right away. So, yeah. Uh, and it works. People react to that. So uh, what we had is uh, we released uh, our Russian version without Russian voices, and we added them later, and people started trusting us because of what we were doing. They were seeing that we were reactive. So We've been engaged, and we have people coming and asking us, is there a Russian voice in this game? And we were saying, no, but it's coming. And on the YouTube trailer video, we've put it right there, right in the description. We said, this is an English trailer, but the Russian version is coming shortly. And people were saying, they were not saying like, oh, you idiots, you should have done it before. But they were saying, cool, thank you. I'll buy it and I'll update it when you have the Russian language out. So when you talk to the community, when you handle the communication directly, they can be very forgiving and very supportive because they like you as a studio. They like you as a developer. That's like the big sort of goodwill that you have as a developer. Yeah. So um, but there's also a couple of secrets behind all these launches and the work behind it. This is um, 100 emails, depending on what the topic is, it's not a lot. But when it comes to just something which you're supposed to just upload and push on a button and submit it there, this is a quite long email thread. If you think about uh, r just releasing on Steam, how many mails we've done about put this screenshot there, put this thing there, put that text there. I've seen publishers, big publishers actually, where that is being done by an intern and he just puts some text there and you can see it. You, if you browse the Steam catalog, you can see really bad descriptions and you can see good descriptions which give you an idea about the game. It's a very important uh, thing to take care about and as a developer it doesn't come naturally because you might be dealing with how the hell am I going to make sure that I'm going to make uh, run my game with sufficient um, frame rate, whatever, and then you're suddenly spending like, before you know it, like four out of five days just discussing, are we going to put the word the in front of it, or are we going to not put the word the in front of it? Well, I remember, if you remember, we've put a quote in, in the description of the game, and then we've put two more quotes, and one quote wasn't okay for Steam, because they said that it doesn't really reflect the whatever truthfulness of opinion, even though it was a real quote, so we removed it. So th th anything that you do about releasing will take you a lot of iterations, and you have to be there. And, and, and at Larian, everybody was involved, producers, artists, game designers, Sven as the CEO of the studio. And, and I, I bet that any successful release that worked out like this on day one took a lot of effort behind the scenes, and now you just get drunk and forget about all that, and then you start again, and then you say, oh, it's easy, it's just a one-day job. <laughs> Uh, so now we're doing a re-release, uh, a bigger uh, retail release. That was a digital release. We're doing a retail release of our, uh, all our previous games and a kind of an anthology. And um, it started out really easy. Like, we're just going to put three CDs together. We'll put it in a nice box. We'll put some nice lettering on top of it, and then we'll just ship it around. And uh, then we started talking to our partners everywhere in the different territories. And uh, this thing particularly is driving me personally bananas right now. Uh, it's turned out into a, a situation, well, it's a, it's a good situation. We are talking to the French, how do you think your box should be? We're talking to the Polish, how do you think your box should be? We're talking to the Germans, how do you think your box should be? Ending up, of course, in the fact that we all have different boxes, uh, with different messages, with different ordering of screenshots, etc., etc. So the work amplifies by the fact that we are taking this local approach, but we know that it will probably also amplify our sales, so it's worthwhile. But again, when we started out as a self-publishing developer, we didn't think of all this stuff. We didn't think that we were going to be dealing with it. And so what's happening is that uh, at a certain point, we had like half our studio was working on publishing rather than on development. So you can imagine what happened to our development schedule. And I think for you as a developer, if you launch your game and somebody says, 
GOG comes to you and says, how about you give us art book in PDF to go along with the game? You can say, yeah, sure. And then it'll take you like five days. And then you discover that there's text and that you want to also provide German version, French version, Russian version, Polish version. And then the guys who do your Russian version say, oh, we'd like to match your translation of the game. Do you have the game translated? Yes. Do we have the lock kit? No. And it just evolves and evolves. So the releasing stuff, it's good for players. It's good when you get tons of stuff. But this tons of stuff, it takes a lot of effort on your side. And you should just plan it. You should just sort of say, this is going to be an emergency. And we're going to take care of it until it's out. Um, the second part. Now that we define the publishing, how can you as a developer be? We try to give some general things that can be applicable to any situation, any size of the studio. So this is the part-time developer publisher. I don't know what, what maybe it's cool. Uh, you know what is a developer? Developer is like a big publisher who sets the studio in-house and tells them what to do and normally you get the branded product, which sucks and flops. And then they say, oh, the developers are shit. Let's do something else. The developer is also the same thing. It's like a developer who thinks that they can publish, who thinks that they are smarter than the market, and they don't care about the boxes and screenshots and cover art and trailers that just do the great game. The best idea is if internally in your team you have someone for development and someone for publishing. That someone can be an intern. That someone can be just, I don't know, your best friend. But someone who thinks who wakes up with the thoughts of publishing and not really the development. There are two different tools. One is not better than the other. And if your studio has both of the tools, then you can be, oh, I'm going to skip that. Da -da -da. You can read this on the world. Um, the developers think about the game. And my biggest discovery was that when I sat down with Sven, who has 15 years of development, I got 15 years of publishing, we still speak different English. Mm. He talks about the game as an idea, a vision, something that's still flexible in the realization. And for example, I don't like the interface. He doesn't see that as a problem because he will change the interface 20 times before the game ships. But to me as a publisher, I'm looking at this and I'm saying, well, I don't like the color of the font. And for him, it's stupid because the color of the font will change six months down the line. But for me, it's a product. For me, it's like, what happens if tomorrow I have to burn this and take it to the shop and give it to people? We have different standpoints, and we need the dialogue. And it took some time for us to establish this dialogue so that it's not skewed toward the uh, everything is possible and everything is final. Yeah. So um, as you can understand, it's um, or it should be clear by now that it's important that you have an in-house team that does your publishing. So what does our cons uh, team consist of? We have uh, a biz developer, uh, this is Sergey. Uh, he's also taking care of the publishing, so he's actually already doing too many jobs in one person because it's uh, business development is really a lot of work. Uh, we have one guy uh, who's responsible for all uh, of our web assets, so the one that Thomas, the web guy, we'll call, we call him. And he's just basically revamping everything which is online for us. We have one video guy, so we have Thomas, the video guy. Uh, he's just filming all the time, so we have assets which are very cheap. It's basically camera footage, and he has a big montage thing, and he makes nice movies with it, which we can release on YouTube because nowadays the medium is video. Uh, we are hiring PR community managers on top of the PR managers that we've had for every single territory because it's getting too much uh, on that front. And then we have probably the biggest thing is that we have 20% of our team helping out with the publishing. And um, what Sergey was saying, you need to have and developer and publisher in-house. You actually need to get the same relation like you used to have with your publisher who was an exterior party and so that you have the same cursing and yelling and so forth going on and saying you don't understand what I'm saying except that it's your own company, so both parties know that it's for their own good and there's no hidden agendas. Um, but if you say, well, development is dominant to publishing, it's not going to work. Uh, if you say publishing is dominant to development, it's not going to work either. They need to live in synergy. They need to have their own abilities. They need to have their own flexibility in making their own decisions in those territories where they need and for anything that they have to communicate with each other. I think last week we got a, a request from one of the magazines saying, we're going to give you a spread to the screenshot of Dragon Commander. We'd like to feature it. It's going to be very prominent because we like the visuals and so on. And then we had a meeting, and we said, can we afford to spend 
eight hours making the screenshot specifically for this magazine. It was a development decision, it was a publishing decision. From development side, the designers had to be involved, producers had to be involved. Where do we screenshot this? Can we have this and this? Do we need custom stuff? From the publishing decision is, what do we get out of that if we invest eight hours of development work into the spread? So in the end, I think we ended up doing it, but it was, it was not a given. If I would be 100% publisher, I would say, go and do this. I'm gonna get coverage, mm -hmm. it's good for you. As a developer, he will say, well, screw this. I got my development work. I'm not going to do these spreads in the magazine. Well, we found sort of a compromise. Yeah, this is another one also. This was also a big learning experience for us. Uh, so we, at some point, we had to announce uh, our game in Divinity Original Sin. And that was, uh, what are we? It was this year, right? May. Yeah, yeah May. <laughs> and uh, so uh, I thought initially, well, we're going to do the press release. We're going to release a nice trailer. And that's going to be it. This man thought a little bit differently about <laughs> that. And he said, you know what? We're going to just fly over all the press uh, to Ghent. One from guy. First it was one guy, one guy from each. Well, OK, so it started with PC Gamer uh, through Tom, our PR manager, who says PC Gamer is willing to do an exclusive first look. PC Gamer magazine. OK, it's pretty good. All right. So hmm, he says, that's only the US. What about Germany? What about France? They don't read PC Gamer. They don't read that much uh, English magazines. So uh, he says, you know what? We'll invite a uh, journalist from every single key territory. Uh, so, and he says, OK, what are the key territories? He ended up with 18 key territories. So we're going to invite all of these guys to Ghent. We'll give them an exclusive presentation. But hmm, uh, we need to do this like a month before the official announcement, because otherwise, uh, these people are not going to have the time to put it in their magazine. The only problem was we had scheduled to show everything a month later in our development schedule, and he just moved everything one month before. So then we had the choice. Uh, we could crunch for three weeks at a time that we really didn't want to crunch, uh, and somehow managed to do that presentation. Or we could just ignore it and just go with the press release and the trailer. We chose for the former. And if you look at the press coverage that Larian as a very small studio has had, if you just look online, it's enormously amplified and, and, and uh, actually too much compared to what would be normal for a small studio. But that's the result of what that particular action cost us some money. You, $30,000. $30,000, I mean, but if you look at the coverage that we got out of it, it was actually fairly cheap. Yeah? So, and then that's where we started actually thinking, so if we do these events like go to E3 or go to Gamescom, have a booth there, let's just look at how much coverage we generate and just divide it by the amount of money that we have. And then it actually turns out to be pretty cheap, if you think about it. Um, skipping this, um, let's yeah. talk about Director's Cut. Uh, yeah, okay, so that's one that happened fairly recently. So he's, he keeps on thinking, he basically he's bored, I guess. He, he, he needs to have stuff to do and stuff to publish and stuff to talk about. So we have this product uh, or game uh, called uh, Dragon Knight Saga, which in itself is a remastered version of another game called Divinity 2 Ego Draconis. And he said, we should re-release it, because I don't like the way that different things have been positioning it there. You have a different version in Germany than you have in Russia, you have in France, it doesn't fit, I don't like the logo and stuff like that. So we should repackage it completely and release it again. And so I'm a developer and I'm saying, well, a, re a new release, that means we need to put in new content, six months of extra work, all right? Six months times 10 guys, 60 man months, so we can get it ready by middle of next year. He says, no, 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 I want it next month. I say, well, that's impossible, and he says, well, we still need it because it makes sense to do it. And so we start thinking, start thinking, and then we come up with a couple of features. We haven't, we're not going to announce it yet, but a couple of very stupid features that no developer had thought about. But he said, that's sufficient. We can repackage around that. And so that entire exercise is happening. So that was, again, an example of the internal feedback publisher developer. We have to hurry, I think. Uh, <laughs> You should be ready to, to polish your assets until they're good enough. A lot of times when you're discussing description of the game, the cover, the announcement, the way that you present the game to the world, people will say, well, you're stupid if you don't get it. Or they can always Google or they can always go to Rock, Paper, Shotgun or whatever. But actually, we went through, as a publishing entity, we went through like dozens of drafts and polish and changes and rolling it back and saying, you know what? Three times before, it was better. Let's go all the way back. So publishing is about revisions. Don't get pissed off that your publishing intern or whatever your publishing employee will keep going back and forth and changing little tiny things. Everything matters. Just let this guy do this their job. Uh, for developer, I heard it many times, quality of the game is important. If it's a good game, it's going to sell. Sure. If you look at frictional games, they're making great games and they're selling wonderfully. But 
the presentation also matters. How you deliver this game. I, I don't really know much about the latest game from Frictional, except for what I've read here and there. But there is no idea in my head, so I'm not really saying, you know, maybe I'll get it, but maybe I'll get it on sale one year after it comes out. There's no rush for me to go and do it. So quality is at the heart, but the presentation and the way that you deliver is also essential. You can have great food in your restaurant and weird service, very late service or whatever, and then people are not going to come there. Uh, a lot of developers go around and say, I've sold 100,000 units, I've made a ton of money. Good, but maybe you could have done three times better or half a million units. Before GOG launched, nobody imagined the money that you can make from your back catalog. Now you're making it. Now we're, I don't know, I can't tell you about the figures, mm -hmm. but it's like tens of thousands of copies of Divine Divinity sold on GOG. And this is just on top, extra. This is just because we've done that. Um, I still have 10 slides to go. <laughs> We're not going to mention you need to do QA also. Uh, okay, so we'll wrap it up very rapidly. But, uh, well, this is actually what I just talked about the anthology. Okay. Yeah, so go ahead. This then is then we relaunched the Vendivinity on Steam, uh, invested two many months into this relaunch, and sold over 35,000 copies on Steam of a 2002 year old game. And that was pretty impressive and above our expectations. Um, if you have content, if you have any kind of content, you can start taking care of this content right now. I want to add one important thing there. It's, um, it's amazing for me as a developer. When you, make, when you release a product, you spend a lot of time in it. And you're a game developer, so you're usually thinking about larger things. And uh, it's amazing the small things that you probably have in your back catalog that you can do something and generate a story out of it and have uh, people write about or talk about it, which is ultimately what you want, people to hear about what your message or what your games are about. And uh, that is a very key thing that I learned about the publishing also. Finding, I'm managing just going to shut up, this yeah. up because that, that's just the summary. OK, so let's just do the summary in Q&A very quickly. Publishing is about money talking to your community and media and making sure that everything is in one place when you release it. Self-publishing to us means that you have to have someone in the studio thinking about this all the time, maybe just a small guy, maybe just a young guy, an intern, whatever. But it's important to have this point of view internally. You have to have a lot of patience. It's like a development. There is a lot of small things that you need to make. And you can do it right now as long as you have your first game out. Maybe your publisher has it out. You can come up and say, hey, I want to help. How about I do this and this and this and do a trailer about this? And you'll get the experience that will be invaluable when you launch your big game. Now let's talk about Q&A, if anybody has any questions. Anybody, any questions? Yeah, sure. Do we have a mic or we just? Yeah, there no. should be a mic. It's coming. Uh, there in front. Just, I think, go ahead and ask and I'll yeah. repeat. Um, some developers told me they had quite a hassle uh, publishing on Steam because they had to change their entire deployment scheme technically, uh, specifically for that platform, while I heard from other people that they actually had to do it so users have a unified experience and uh, don't, don't have to change their behavior every time they get a new game. So how was your experience working with that platform or working with different platforms that have different uh, requirements on how you actually deploy like patches, one. updates, and so on? We, uh, we take the bottom-up approach, basically meaning that we're going to adapt ourselves to the platform. For instance, we're talking to digital vendors, and they're saying, well, we don't want you to exclusively use this service. We need a service that we also can use, and we're actually doing that. Uh, it fits with our philosophy of following the market. So if somebody in Poland tells us, you know, the Polish audience wants this, and somebody in New Zealand tells us the New Zealand audience wants this, then we figure that this person knows his audience better than us. And the extra effort of putting the work in there to change and adapt the platform is a better approach, I think, rather than saying, well, this is our unified view, and this is how you're going to do it. Because that's me telling you what you should do, rather than you telling me, well, this is how I would like to have it. I think the big advantage of a small studio or any studio is that you can just ride with the waves. The big publishers, they have to worry, oh, what's going to happen in five years? Should we bank on OnLive? Should we bank on Gaikai? Should we do this and this? As a developer, you just make up your game, and then you look at the market, and then you say, OK, I can do it here, here, here. Let's do it. I don't know what's going to happen in three years. I don't care. There's a question over there. Um, it seems that your story is somehow similar to the other uh, developers who started their own games back in the 80s or something. 
and then became uh, publishers. So do you consider, for example, uh, to, for example, uh, sell some other games from all other studios to became one day a publisher, something that yeah. you were running from? <laughs> I'm, I am pretty sure that that might be in your ambition, but that's definitely not mine. I mean, I'm... Oh, we're, <laughs> we're, we're, to be honest, right now we're helping our development friends by... We're not charging anything. We're not, like, commercially publishing. But guys call us and say, hey, we want to release a game in France. What do you think? And we share information. Because we, we've gone a long way to collect all that information, which is still actual, and we're sharing it with development friends. It's very helpful for them. So it's good for them to know us. And one day we'll come and ask them about something. But it's not the commercial thing, because to be a commercial publishing operation, we'll need 50 more people to take Yeah, care. it's also, it's, then you need to have the real DNA of a publisher in there. That would be a really separate uh, And operation. then we'll start screwing them and taking their margin. And then of course, we'll become yeah. evil. And then, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, uh, it's already bad enough as is. Anybody Any else? Point? No? OK, I guess that's it. Okay, the final note, I'll say that if you go to Kickstarter, Kickstarter is a great mirror for the project and for you as a developer. If you go to Kickstarter, and if you look at the way that the teams pitch their projects, you can s immediately spot the mistakes. You can open up this product page and read one sentence description. And the majority of cases, they just don't make sense. They are talking about themselves. They are talking about what they plan to do. They are not talking about the product that they want my money for. And the teams that are successful in Kickstarter show you that they can interact with the community, they can post updates frequently, they can talk to the community, make changes, they can engage the community, and that they are basically describing the game in a very reasonable way. If you look at the, um, the Banner Sagas, I can't remember the name of the team, the Banner Saga post-mortem, how they've launched it in Kickstarter, what they say is the same thing that this man is saying. It took them a whole month of Kickstarter work just to get launched and funded. They couldn't do anything for this month, but just worked with the Kickstarter. So essentially, they've gone through their publishing stage in one month, super fast, super intensive. But I would, admit, I would recommend anyone to try to go to Kickstarter, follow it, and see if you as a player like certain descriptions and what problems you can spot in the description of the project and how people talk to the audience. And you can learn from that very fast because there's a lot of projects. The same thing about Greenlight on Steam. I'm sure it's going to come to this way. Okay. All right, thanks guys uh, for watching and listening to us and have fun. Yeah.